feminist women. Mulheres feministas. Zanone feminist. Banyu vachikonzero chevakadzi. Nessa. Mujeres feministas. Yan femini. On fem activi. Nari mukti. Matapang na babae. Kekchi mai. Ka ishk. Welcome to Women's Magazine. I am Lisa Detmer and I am your host today. And today we look at how the COVID virus has affected domestic violence, especially in South Asian communities. But first, Kate Raphael looks at racism and misogyny in sports. As racism is becoming a subject many more people are becoming aware of, some white people may still think that sports is one area in which African Americans have had more access to the highest levels of pay and prestige, and assume that black athletes are exempt from the forms of oppression and discrimination that other black people in our country encounter. But athletes from football star Colin Kaepernick, who donated generously to the bail fund for Minneapolis protesters, to tennis champions Naomi Osaka and Coco Goff, who marched in the streets, have been quick to put these illusions to rest. In fact, black women athletes often experience the worst of misogyny mixed with racism. In her next segment, Kate Raphael talks with Joan Steidinger, author of Stand Up and Shout Out, Women's Fight for Equal Pay, Equal Rights, and Equal Opportunities in Sports, about struggles for equality of women and equality among women in sports. As athletes and fans alike wonder when and if competition will resume, Several major events have occurred in the world of women's sports in the last few weeks. The gender discrimination lawsuit by four members of the World Cup champion U.S. women's soccer team was dismissed by a federal judge. He rejected their allegations that they were underpaid in comparison to the U.S. men's team. And in the ongoing scandal surrounding USA Gymnastics, female coach Maggie Haney was suspended for eight years after an investigation of complaints that she emotionally abused athletes, including Olympic gold medalist Lori Hernandez. Dr. Joan Steidinger writes about both of these issues in her new book, Stand Up and Shout Out, Women's Fight for Equal Pay, Equal Rights, and Equal Opportunities in Sports. Dr. Steidinger is a sports psychologist and an athlete based here in the Bay Area. Her previous book is Sisterhood in Sports, How Female Athletes Collaborate and Compete, and she teaches at San Jose State University. She joins me by Zoom now from her home in Mill Valley. So, Dr. Joan, you're a sports psychologist, and your last book was more or less in that field. This one's more about sexism in sports and the political dimensions of what women athletes have to overcome. What made you decide to venture into this new terrain? Well, I myself was a pre-Title IX athlete. And so I was faced way back when with inequality in sport, going back to when I was in high school and I was playing tennis and badminton and I was got a chance to try out for the first women's uh, cross-country team. And i am always been a good runner, but I tried out for the team and I made the team and I was so excited. When I got home, I immediately went to my mother and said, I made the team, I'm so excited. And she says, it's not ladylike, you can't participate. And that was the end of that. And so my interest in this kind of inequality goes way back and the interesting part is my first book, Sisterhood in Sports, I dedicated to my mom. My mother was very shy, painfully shy. So she didn't really speak up for herself enough. And so when I wrote the first book, I said, I'm speaking up for my mother. And when I was exploring what book to write next, I started, um, I sat down with a colleague and started hashing things out because we were trying to figure out what I would have a passion for. And we came across the way women are treated in sport still today. And I said, that's it. That's it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a book on women and inequality in sport and the need to keep fighting for it. 
And the interesting thing is in coming up with the name Stand Up and Shout Out, I didn't even remember writing this dedication to my mother in the previous book about I was speaking up for her. But I guess in this book, I am speaking up for her along with millions of other women. And so there are things in the book that are controversial because of that. Like what? Like, well, my book is intermixes the white and the black experience. And typically books have been, in terms of this inequality issue, been primarily about African-American female athletes or white female athletes, and they're not mixing the two together. And one of the things I'm doing in the book is intermixing the two experiences, which some people appreciate and some people don't. I think it's really important because we have incredible athletes in all our cultures in the United States that are females, and they all should be, in my opinion, treated way more equally than they are. In terms of soccer, going back to soccer, actually what happened, just to refine it a little bit, is what's happened is they had this lawsuit that was had to do with pay, facilities, travel, a bunch of uh, other issues besides pay. And what the judge ruled against was the pay issue. So he's uh, actually allowing the other issues to go forward. The problem that will now exist with women's soccer is they, in trying to negotiate with their federation, they'll have less leverage. FIFA, the, the uh, international association that oversees soccer, I describe in my book as being misogynistic because they are. For the World Cup, the last two World Cups, the ultimate prize for men versus women was so unequal, it was laughable. When they won in 2015, the prize for the winning team was $2 million for the women. The prize for the men's winning team was $38 million. And they said they were going to make it more equal for last year's World Cup. And what they did is... They kept the men's at $38 million for winning, and they upped the women's to $4 million for winning. And I talk about them quite a bit in terms of that they give a lot of lip service to doing things for the women and then don't follow through. I talk a lot about the media, and including ESPN, that isn't really supporting women's sports. Perfect example is... One afternoon, I happened to turn it on to see if there's anything interesting with women's sports. And what I got was the World Cornhole Championships. Cornhole is a game where there's a board and opposing teams try to throw a beanbag into the board. This is not sports. And then following that there was also another time I turned it on and it was the world water sliding championship. And it was just these kids sliding down the slide with water running down it. And then the next thing that ESPN had was marbles. It's amazing. Somebody actually interviewed me a few weeks ago about tennis, and I th- they said, oh, I think tennis is fine. And I said, tennis isn't fine. The only thing in tennis that's equal is the Grand Slams and a few of the other major tournaments, but pretty much it's still pretty unequal. I'm pointing out in the book and, and using a lot of data that things are not equal, and they're not even equal in the sports we think they are. And there's only one sports team in the United States that's equal, and it's the World Surf League. They had a women CEO come in a couple of years ago, restructure everything, and restart it and made all the pay equal for, for all their tournaments for men and for women. Yeah, there was a really astounding statistic in the book that I remember off the top of my head because it was just so mind-boggling, and that was that the average pay for women 
professional basketball players in the WNBA is $75,000 a year. And in the NBA, the men's league, the average is $5 million. Well, I, actually, I, there's, a, yeah. Kate, there's a change in that that's happened since I wrote the book. In January, I think a whole variety of factors contributed. And, and a year ago in my book, Dr. Dave Barry commented that how little money it would take the NBA to brace up the salaries of the WNBA. But in January, they renegotiated everything. And now all the women's salaries have doubled and the superstars will have be making a lot like a half a million as a starting point and plus sponsorships and, and team wins and et cetera. So, and they've made um, progress across facilities and travel and those things as well. So there's been a significant change since the book was written, which is a small sign of progress. But then you get the women's soccer lawsuit that just recently was called in terms of pay. And then we have a setback again. What the judge said was that when he looked at the pay, it seemed that the women are actually making more than the men's team. But the reason for that is that they're playing a lot more games because they're winning a lot more. And so, you know, and they're getting bonuses for winning the World Cup where the men didn't even qualify for the World Cup, I think. So it's not really parody, but it is better than it was. And that may make people feel that, well, of course it takes time to achieve parity, but we're on the track. And so this problem is going to correct itself. What's your feeling? Well, about? I think now they'll be trying to negotiate with USA soccer for the pay issues and not through court. And it'll be interesting because the real misogynistic leader of USA soccer stepped down because he started saying that women didn't have the aptitude to work on a global stage and just really outrageous statements that he had the attorneys actually say in court and he stepped down and now the 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 vice president of of USA soccer who was a former player and world cup team member from 99 herself has stepped into the role of acting president but we don't know what's going to happen because um, she was on the board that was trying to decide what to do, you know, all along. Maybe she was outvoted, but my hope is she would be open to working with the team to making things better and more right, particularly from the last five years is what they're talking about at this point. Michelle Roberts is said to be the most powerful woman in sport today. She is head of the NBA Players Association. And she has a great quote that I was just looking up in my book that says, first, you have to get in the room. And when you get in the room, you have to own the room. And I think that there's not enough women who are being allowed to come in and own the room. In coaching, for instance, two people can play exactly the same role and the men are always getting paid more. And they say a lot of times that the white men want to they want to hire people who look like them. And, you know, in terms of the NCAA, it's a perfect example. Division I NCAA sports has only 9.8% female coaches. And of that 9.8% female coaches, 8.3% are white and 06 are African American. 89% uh, sports editors in the United States are white men. Yet you look at player composition and you look at females playing sport and it's getting bigger and bigger in terms of females playing sport and more important, particularly the WNBA, which is making progress. But there's a new website called The Athletic that says that it covers all sports we, our site covers all sports, except for they don't cover any women's sports. And so what's really important about women in leadership positions, like 
Women's Sports Foundation and Black Women in Sport Foundation is they're providing, they provide models of women who have taken the lead and said, we're going to do something about this situation. You mentioned earlier that you made a decision to incorporate discussion of racism in sports along with sexism in your book in a sort of integrated way. It seemed like that was something that you came to more in the course of writing the book than rather than a decision you made at the inception of the project. And, you know, talk about some of what you learned that maybe pushed you in that direction. And also, can you talk about the Black Women in Sports Foundation and what, how that got started and what it does? I really always wanted to integrate this book because I think female athletes are female athletes. And I think that we need to support each other. I think when it really drew my attention was going back to 2012, because I've always admired bigger, stronger girls in sport and women in sport, and that people's skewed view of women and accomplished women in sport is so narrow, it's like a tall, skinny, blonde girl is, and skinny, not not like even a normal shape, is the the athlete. And back, going back to 2012, I wa- we watched the Olympics religiously. There was a British heptathlete that was mixed race. She was um, Jamaican and white. And she was petite, meaning she was smaller, but she was so beautifully muscled and developed. So there was a lot of hype going on about her in the, in the London Olympics. And one of the British Olympic officials called her fat. Well, what was great is she ended up winning the gold medal in the heptathlon. There was a study done by a journalist named Dr. Cynthia Frisbee, I think it was University of Missouri. And she looked at 643 articles that contained information about Serena Williams and Angelique Kerber, who were often rivals back in the day. And in these articles, she was look in these articles, she looked for microaggressions. Serena received 743 microaggressions in these articles she reviewed. The German Angelique Kerber, she only received 18 microaggressions. Can you just I should say first of all that Angelique Kerber is a German tennis she, player. Yeah. Um, but- Winner of and she's she's white, <laughs> right? And winner of several Grand Slams. Yeah, compared to Serena, who's won I think twenty two, and so can you just explain like what kinds of microaggressions we're talking about in articles? Well, they're they're negative comments about Serena in her appearance and as a person in her play you know, from a variety of perspectives. One of the things in interviewing three of the four founders of the Black Women's uh, Sports Foundation, in Sports Foundation, I was honored to be able to to interview Dr. Nikki Frank, who was the first African-American woman to be on the Olympic fencing team back in the 70s. and became a coach for Temple for 40-some years. Dr. Alpha Alexander, I interviewed, and she's another founder of the organization, and she has been an administrator in administrative positions in terms of leadership and now teaches in sport and actually also helped lead delegations basically to youth Olympics all over the world. And then finally, the person who I think put them all together, Dr. Tina Sloan Green, was the first African American woman in the 70s to play lacrosse on the lacrosse national team, and then went to Temple University and coached for 20 years, and then put all of her efforts into the Black Women in Sport Foundation. They wanted to expose 
young African American girls and other girls of color to other sports besides traditional sports, basketball and track and field, which were always considered traditional uh, female African American sports. Because if you looked at, at these three women, particularly Dr. Frank and Tina, they played in sports. There were no black women back then or African-American women back then. So they not only expose them to these sports, they provide structure and they provide tutoring and they pr try to provide a really positive place for these kids to learn about sports and to give them support maybe academically that they might not get otherwise. I have asked a number of African-American women if they'd heard of the Black Women in Sport Foundation, and they hadn't. And in fact, there was very little even on the internet about any of these incredible women. And I thought it was time to really begin to talk about all well-known women in sport, not just the white women. At the beginning, you mentioned Title IX. And Title IX is a 1972 law which was designed to eliminate gender discrimination in public education in general. But when most people hear about Title IX, they probably think about sports. Right. And certainly Title IX has changed a lot for women and girls in terms of opportunity to play sports in schools and in colleges. But you suggest it hasn't changed as much as people might think. Title IX was an educational law. It was meant to give equal education at the high school and college levels to girls equally to boys. So it wasn't even related to sports per se. I think it's had the most impact in sports. And I think it's really opened the doors for more and more young girls and women to participate in sports. But what it hasn't done is put women in more positions of power. In fact, it's done the opposite. When you look at coaches of women's teams, when Title IX was put into place, female teams were coached 93% by women coaches. And then when women got a footing and really were making getting – highly involved in sports in high school and college, all of a sudden that number started dropping and dropping and dropping. And now it's down to 41% of female teams are coached by women. One of the things you mentioned in the book is that as schools increasingly face budget cuts in so many jurisdictions that often the first sports that suffer cuts are women's sports and that Title IX really, any gains made under Title IX sort of start to fade as there becomes increasing competition for scarcer public funds. So many different people are suffering so much because of COVID-19 and the economic and social disruption that it's causing. Sports may not be at the top of many people's priority lists, but I have often thought about the athletes, you know, many of whom trained their entire lives for opportunities that because of this pandemic and the response to it, they may not have. The Tokyo Olympics are postponed for at least a year. It could be longer. And doubtless, that will mean that some athletes miss their chance to go to an Olympics. And in certain sports, that's the ticket to any kind of career. So, you know, some people will certainly lose their opportunity to compete at the highest level. And I think that's especially true for women. I wonder if you've talked to anyone in the sports world, athletes or commentators or anyone about what the impact might be. Well, I think you've kind of summed it up well, Kate. <laughs> I think the dollars will decrease, the opportunities will decrease. And you're right, by postponing in a year, there will be people who are going to go this year that will not 
end up going. Even Megan Rapino is talking about the fact that she may not be up to Olympic level in a year. Seems doubtful, but that was her comment recently. I have athletes in my classes at San Jose State who were, you know, they're on scholarship and they just were cut off at the knees when all sport was called off. But I think that right now it's so uneven, it's going to even be worse. I mean, currently, in terms of collegiate scholarships for sports, young young men receive 65,000 more scholarships in sports than young women, and which is equal to about $190 million. And I think that's going to decline further. Well, it's a lot to think about, and there's a lot more in the book that we didn't get a chance to discuss. So if you're interested in some of these issues, check out Stand Up and Shout Out, Women's Fight for Equal Pay, Equal Rights, and Equal Opportunities in Sports. That's the new book by my guest, Joan Steidinger. You can get it from any independent bookstore or order it from bookshop.org the new indie alternative to Amazon. Dr. Joan, thanks so much for this time. Thank you. If you are just tuning in, you are listening to KPFA Radio's Women's Magazine, and I am your host today, Lisa Detmer. Next up, we look at domestic violence in the South Asian community in a time of shelter in place, and we examine how COVID has made it so much more difficult for women seeking help to access that help now, especially immigrant women. According to the World Health Organization, one in every three women across the globe experience physical and or sexual violence in their lifetime. And at least 30% of all women in relationships have experienced physical and or sexual violence by their partners. Quote, the very conditions that are needed to battle the coronavirus, isolation, social distancing, restrictions on freedom of movement are perversely the very conditions that feed into the hands of abusers who now find state-sanctioned circumstances tailor-made for unleashing abuse. Up next, Priti Mangala Shaker talks to advocates from two well-known Bay Area organizations working to end domestic violence within South Asian communities in the Bay Area. Zakia Afrin is with Maya Tree, where she manages the Helpline Peer Counseling, Immigration Assistance, and Legal Advocacy Programs at Maya Tree in San, San Jose. Bindu Uman Fernandez works with Narika, which is continuing to offer counseling, safety planning, legal and shelter referrals, and support groups by phone to South Asian domestic violence survivors. This is a very intense time for all of us with what's going on um, with both the COVID shelter in place as well as all the protests that have been unfolding across the country. Can we begin by both of you sharing how shelter in place has impacted your own staff or team's day-to-day work? Bindu, would you like to get started? Sure. Um, so, yeah, you know, Narika, the organization, uh, is a domestic violence and intimate partner abuse uh, support and prevention program. So how the shelter in place has affected our team and our staff right now is, of course, the primary thing. All of our services have moved virtually to either the phone or video. So this includes our counseling sessions, support groups, job programs, wellness programs. All of them have moved uh, online to the phone and video and this is very uh, kind of very interesting because it is it has to become a very quick learning curve for our clients uh, most of our clients are used to coming and meeting us in person used to just doing the phone while now they have to think about tech-based solutions they have to think about do they have a laptop can they access it and it's not um, monitored by the person um, harming them etc so uh, you know a very interesting kind of dynamics there uh, calls to our helpline have actually tripled uh, year over year, which is kind of scary, um, given that we knew many of our survivors would find it harder to reach out to us. Um, so just the sheer volume of the people we are reaching out and serving uh, has, has really kind of gone over capacity for our team. We just knew that our team couldn't serve the number of people reaching out. And so we had to kind of move our counselor trainings online to get a new batch of volunteers coming in. Uh, maybe a silver lining to all this is really the scale of innovation creativity, speed, 
the the kind of band-aid solutions are really evolving and are amazing just with how the team and clients even have stepped up to really work in this new normal uh, we're all doing things we never thought we would do or dreamt would be challenges and the team i know is stepping up and and so is you know community members and clients and so on um yeah so it's it's just been a lot of a lot of different things while working with this new normal for sure So Zakia uh, your turn how has Maitri been affected uh, since the shelter in place to cold You know we have been dealing with a pandemic of domestic violence for many years now so the challenges are not new what happened they became more complex for us Now from day 1 we started uh, working remotely for all of our uh, staff members safety and our client safety our helpline is still live from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Our le- legal advocacy program is continuing with virtual appointments. We are prioritizing, just like the courts are, restraining orders, child custody matters, and anything that has to deal with people's immigration uh, status. Our transitional housing program is continuing as is because we have residents there and we are responsible for their uh, well-being, both physical, emotional, and otherwise. Uh, we have reorganized our outreach program to be focused on social media and other virtual models. I know Bindu has already mentioned how we are trying to keep up uh, with the new challenges, technically and uh, going through innovation. Almost every every new day, there is a new learning mm-hmm. for us and for our clients. Now, these have posed, of course, many challenges and also opened many new doors of opportunities for us. outside of work i also want to mention that personally uh, it's very challenging for all of us right as human beings as the women with the young children as uh, uh, primary caregivers for the some of uh, elderly parents uh, so we are trying to uh, instill self care in our work as much as possible and whenever we are in touch with the client making sure they are understanding what shelter in place actually means for them how it is changing their day to day activities and how they can uh, take care of their mental health uh, right now because it can bring back the trauma of being controlled by an abuser who would not let a person out who would not Uh, let um, somebody leave freely right there would be restrictions in going out doing doing things they might want to do uh, using technology and all of that so this is relieving the trauma for many of our clients so we are also trying to focus on uh, the mental health as well as the immediate crisis intervention needs for our clients so could you speak a little bit more how uh, domestic violence issues have been impacted in the aftermath of covid how, what have what have you been seeing or noticing in the in the cases that you've been getting um, bindu shall we start with you sure i yeah i'll start by saying since we serve uh, since we prim- prim- primarily work with south asian survivors uh, of course one of the biggest needs continues to be language access just the fact that uh, they may not be able to read new benefits coming in that might only be written in english um, or they may not be able to actually speak with a county or a city official uh, so there's a lot of that kind of language access that continues to be amp- amplified Uh, including in the beginning of uh, covid-19 we even knew many of our clients were receiving wrong information about covid-19 from the person causing them harm and and these were all possible just by virtue of the fact that they didn't speak english or didn't have access um, to their own language uh, and information around it so that has definitely been one of the ways that the t- our teams continue to serve our clients by just ensuring that there is support in their regional language uh, for whatever it is they might need it includes counseling legal support uh, benefits um, either offered you know from from various other nonprofits or county etc i would say what we have seen is the sheer instances of 
physical violence has increased a lot. And of course, there's a lot of reasons and, and uh, you know, that's a whole uh, conversation in itself. But financial stressors play a role. Many other factors, including the fact that it really, you know, this situation can try even the best of relationships. And so we have seen that unfold in, in just physical violence and violence in general. We do know many of our survivors cannot call us safely anymore when they are in proximity and don't have excuses to get out of their house. So we knew that going in the lockdown that our survivors couldn't use their usual channels of support. So uh, we had to really think about, okay, well, if they don't have an excuse to go out and call, what are other options? Is it text? Is it chat? Uh, what can we do that people can still reach out to the organization for safety planning while they cannot call us because it's not safe for them to call us? We're seeing a lot of violations in court order. We're seeing restraining orders being violated. We're seeing child custody arrangements being violated, all under the excuse of COVID-19. So we're kind of seeing, hey, how do I, I don't want to take our child um, to a park to ha transfer, you know, to hand over the child to you. So why don't I just keep the child for the next three months mm -hmm. and then we'll figure it out once the lockdown is done. So we've seen this COVID-19 community become the excuse for um, a lot of behavior. Behavior, including like another example was we had a client where the person harming her said, hey, we have a lot of financial worries now. I'm just going to cut your uh, phone plan. So we just have one. And of course, what this meant was she could not now safely call us anymore because mm -hmm. her, her personal phone line went. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing a lot of that. You know, there might be real reasons why actual financial concerns, but also hey, now this becomes the excuse for, for behavior that shouldn't be tolerated, including not allowing them to have access to their medication, et cetera, et cetera. We are definitely seeing our survivors have a lot less reliance on doctors, law enforcement, etc. We've seen many of our survivors in the past go to their primary care doctor and have that be a respite for them or have that be a way that they can receive support of some form or receive help. And a lot of that completely changed after COVID-19 because everyone said, well, I'm in my right mind, I would never go to uh, walk into a hospital right now. I don't want to get something I don't have. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot less reliance on that and a lot less reliance on law enforcement also because like especially in the beginning we saw a lot of that is law enforcement open are the courts open nobody knew and so th there was just a lot of confusion and a lot of wrong information we saw a lot of our survivors being told by the person arming them, they were told, hey, do you think that any of your DV organizations are open? Do you think the lawyers are open or law enforcement? Of course not. They're not going to be open during the lockdown. So no point reaching out. And of course, that has changed and gotten better now. But that was an initial um, response to, to the lockdown. The last thing I think we see is just the need for financial aid has skyrocketed and that's being uh, modest about what actually is happening. It's really a lot of our clients who we haven't spoken to in 25 years, you know, they went through counseling, they went through job programs 25 years ago and now everything has changed. The, the jobs that they were stable in, they're out of, and they've come right back to us and said, hey, we need money for groceries. We need money for rent assistance. I need money for food. What, what do I do? Just that sheer volume of money that needs to go directly in the hand of our clients have hugely increased. And it's, it's something that we process and think about every single day when our clients really don't have access sometimes to, to benefits outside. Um, how do we make sure that one of the best things we can do is put money in the hands of our survivors to support their needs. And we continue to think about creatively how we could meet that need. Thank you. Um, Zakia? Thank you, Bindu. I think you mentioned all that uh, you know. we are also seeing. I just wanted to add a few points. Like Bindu said, people got a lot of misinformation, right? Mm -hmm. That court is not open, police may not take my call. Why should I go to the hospital? So in the first week, while we were sitting in, you know, the only way to describe it is deafening silence. Our helpline was not ringing because people didn't know if we are also open or they did not have a safe space to reach out for help. So what we did, we focused our energy on reaching out for whoever may need to call us to let them know, hey, we are open. Our helpline is still there. We are providing you language access. Please 
call us. At the same time, we reached out to the courts, we reached out to different county uh, self-help centers and got the information what is their new working schedule? Because you know, courts when are not completely closed from day one. They have been still helping people for restraining orders. Police, they are not. They don't uh, take a day off, right? There is an emergency. Police is also there. So what we did, we compiled this information, put it on our website, and got a lot of multilingual resources about what does shelter in place actually mean, what to do, what not to do. What about childcare? What about job? If you are going, if you are losing your job, what kind of benefits you may get? And we started getting calls from uh, some of our ongoing clients and some clients who reached out after many years because they have now fallen into a new, new situation that's either bringing back their traumatic memory or putting them in the place where they have no support system, just like when they first got out of the abusive situation. So we worked with them, uh, helping them applying for different uh, government grants, county grants, employment benefit, unemployment benefits, um, providing them with that kind of support. We focused on that. And of course, a lot of these benefits are uh, not uh, going to everybody. There are many clients who are not eligible for the county provided benefits who cannot really get unemployment because they probably are working um, under the table. They don't have any paperwork to show that they have lost their jobs. So we started helping out those uh, folks uh, with financial needs from our own agency funding and making sure that nobody is falling through the gaps. We tra we help people with their uh, groceries, we help people with rent, uh, we help people with their uh, regular day-to-day -day expenses as well. So that was the first few weeks uh, that we have seen. Now that things are slowly opening up, we also uh, started providing our virtual appointments with some of the attorneys that are helpful for our clients for giving advice. Uh, our immigration assistance program is working with the deadline uh, sensitive applications um, and of course we are still continuing to reach out to whoever may get them about certain tips if you are stuck at home how you can stay uh, healthy how you can get uh, some peace of mind because remember a lot of the clients that we serve not everybody wants to uh, file a training order or get the abuser out of the house. What they want is the violence to stop. So many have the many people have chosen to either go to work only because they can have some alone time in their day, or they will find an excuse to stay away for a certain period of time from the abusive household. Now that those options are very limited. We are really worried about those folks, how they are coping. So we have tried to reach out with our, our radio show. We have had um, counselors talking about how people uh, in general can take care of their mental health and how to create safety. We talked about that. And just to stay healthy and um, if they need to make the call, what options are available. So that's how we have been dealing with it. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Zakia. And I just, I kind of wanted to add, uh, just uh, going off what you said, Zakia, that one of the additional things Narika has seen through sp specifically through the lockdown is just the demog the type of people reaching out to us. And specifically what I mean is that we were seeing an uptick in working professional survivors of domestic violence kind of reach out to us more. So these are your uh, tech employees that traditionally may not have ever wanted to reach out to an organization as us, but now really are in, in a situation where everything is amplified um, and they know that they have to reach out. Uh, we're also more, at, more friends of people reaching out uh, on a personal level i've seen that increase where just friends of friends are like directly reaching out to us and to many of our advocates as well as on our helpline as well just that friends are starting to know 
or hear or being told these disclosures and then they come to us and say, I don't know what to do with that. What do I do? How can I be a better friend? So we're seeing that. Uh, and I know that as a DV organization, right when shelter in place happened, immediately the first thing we thought was, wow, this is this this we know this is going to change how domestic violence is and, and increase it. And of course, everyone mid of March was only thinking about COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And part of our work and our commitment was to advocate for the people with first strengths, right? We went to every foundation we knew, we went to every decision maker of money and we told them, let's let's be certain this is going to affect domestic violence and let's not forget it and what i'm so grateful about is is many of them decided hey you're right like we we know that we shouldn't just give our money to healthcare and to supporting uh, covid-19 and relief there but we should also consider domestic violence as something we want to fund um, and i think that is an important part of our advocacy that we don't just that we didn't kind of run into, oh, wow, yeah, we have to think about COVID-19. But really, as DV advocates, we all said, oh, we can predict this is going to change and create, make things crazier at home. Um, and let's think about that as well. We, we knew immediately that home was not safe. The premise of shelter in place be, was that your home was safe. And we just knew, of course, for all of our clients that home was not safe for them, right? And so I feel so grateful that we kind of I'm sure all of us as organizations and advocates knew it was going to happen. And of course, it has happened. And uh, we we continue to advocate for, for that, uh, to keep a topic like this in the forefront of people's consciousness. Absolutely. Zakia, did you have anything to add? Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. So we Bindu, like, uh, like you said, reaching out to foundations and all of that, we have been uh, doing a lot of advocacy at the state level with the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence. We had our policy advocacy day and the lawmakers uh, wanted to hear from the advocates, what has changed for you? what do you see happening when this shelter in place is gone so we were able to share our experience and how if any kind of uh, external um, you know catastrophe can actually have an impact on domestic violence right when the uh, twin tower attack happened when the financial crisis happened it actually affected our communities in many different ways we were able to share our challenges and the new ways we were thinking about preventative measures of um, of uh, you know to handle this domestic violence crisis uh, we asked for the uh, five billion dollar in prevention funding and also ongoing support for all the domestic violence services that we were providing and we got a very positive uh, feedback we got very uh, positive outlook from these lawmakers and we are really hopeful that uh, like Bindu said this is going to stay at the forefront of any kind of policy budget related mm -hmm. discussion that home is not safe for many of the uh, people living in our society we have as advocates we have known that for many many years now even uh, common folks who never gave it a second thought are also taking it seriously so that's definitely mm -hmm. there and and i would say um you know that is the um tr that truly to me is the silver lining of what is happening that it has really come to become a discussion mm -hmm. and it has come to the forefront of many people that weren't ever thinking about partner violence and abuse mm -hmm. uh, you know we see it with examples like the the california funding from the uh, from the 5 6 billion that zakir was talking about we see it with um, uh, companies like Uber that said, hey, I will give free rides for survivors of domestic violence that need to flee. We're seeing a lot more of that. We're seeing a lot of partnerships with landlords and hotels that say, hey, we will give our spaces to become a shelter, to become like temporary housing while your survivor needs it. And I feel so grateful for that kind of advocacy. It is long overdue, as we all know, but if, if better late than never, as always. It's at least that there are people, uh, there are celebrities, there are people in positions of influence and power that now are forced to actively think about it and actually be held to do something. If that is the only silver lining we get out of all this, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a good step in the right direction. Yes, absolutely.
and in terms of the uptick also that you were talking about um, i remember having a conversation with you bindu i don't know whether it was on email or somewhere i know we haven't met but one of the things that struck me was uh, we were talking about how we have to remove the stigma around um talking about violence and domestic violence especially and how that is slowly shifting but not completely right how do we destigmatize what survivors tend to experience when they speak out or make visible an experience you know that they've gone through and that's that's something to really uh, you know that's something in the context of me too came out uh, in india as well where uh, you know a lot of survivors are hesitant to speak out because of the stigma associated with speaking out right so do you see that shift taking place in the work that you're doing the cases that you're seeing or what has been your experience I would say um I mean a lot has changed and a lot has remained the same uh honestly uh I believe uh sometimes we are more nuanced in the biases we have as we evolve and they are still very deep rooted in many of our communities and many of us uh we all have blind spots and unconscious biases and all of that um I will say the like speaking reading researching about it obsessively is one of the things we all need to do uh, especially as community members that we are not really that if it doesn't affect us that we kind of and and with all social uh, causes right that we don't that we it's it's easier to fall into the pattern of oh it doesn't affect me or oh i will ride the wave of outrage for a week about anything that's happening and then oh but now my life takes precedence and my issues take precedence while really to kind of look from under inside our bubbles outside into what is happening in our communities to our sisters and brothers and our neighbors is important and it's that that awareness needs to happen in a lot of our advocacy work i hear a lot of confusion and like un- disbelief that violence and abuse could happen in the US i hear it from the most well intentioned amazing people that look at me and say what do you mean violence is happening here how could that be i can imagine it happening in india i can't imagine it happening here and these are amazing well educated brilliant people mm-hmm. who don't realize the madness that is in inside the home right and so it's it's important that we all really kind of not sit in our little bubbles that we're thinking about it actively that we're working towards it um and that we're really taking a stand um I, you know i've been thinking a lot about even with our with the protests um it is easier and it is safer not to take a stand at what point is is that complicit uh, complicity right and and what do we do about the violence mm-hmm. and abuse that are hap- that's happening systemic that's happening in our homes etc so mm-hmm. you know speaking about it uh, doing something about it um uh, having our communities and all of us really spend our time and our money um i i firmly believe where you put your money is where you vote and i say this about anything you purchase about people you give money to organizations you give that's your vote and remember that so for our communities and for anyone listening wherever you spend your money is your vote um and wherever you spend your time is also your vote so one of the best things we ask our people is give us your time you know give us your time as as volunteers because there's nothing that replaces it if you can spend your time with us as a volunteer in whatever capacity um it it kind of supports it but you know i mean back to your question i think um a lot of things are still the same uh, there's a lot of shame uh, i i have a friend of mine who experienced dv um in india went to the you know had the courage to go to the police station only to be said and this was you know a year ago only to be said it's a family matter go home go go back to your husband and that still still continues to happen um it's it's important to talk about it and it's important we open our can of worms admit that this is happening and really talk about it um and obsessively talk about it and and kind of work through it uh into really thinking about what we are all a part of we are all part of the problem in many many ways and in many many uh, little nuances we contribute to the change so um I, i think we need to actively think about how do we contribute to the problem uh, and what can we do differently uh, personally and for our communities i also want to mention that this is where the intersections with other issues mm-hmm. become very important for mm-hmm. domestic violence survivors mm-hmm. if we see police brutality 
like what's happening right now against the black population, people of color in the United States, people may not feel comfortable calling cops on their partner. Mm -hmm. If we see that immigration uh, is so hostile as it is right now, there is no protection for deportation for any anybody. And we need comprehensive immigration reform mm -hmm. in this country. We need to make sure that when the law enforcement is involved, they are being culturally responsive. They, under, they can try to understand that not everybody who is calling the police is actually demanding an arrest, which is in many counties that is the protocol, so they will do it. But many people are calling the police in the hopes that maybe they will make the situation or mm -hmm. just make the violence stop. They are not necessarily thinking about what would be the repercussion of this one phone call, right? So we, we need to uh, look at our community to acknowledge this is the problem. And we also have to work with the systems here to make sure somebody who wants to leave an abusive situation does not actually have to choose between being safe and being solvent that mm -hmm. that is not acceptable and that the situation cannot change unless we make those policy changes we shall be known by the company we keep by the ones who circle round to tend these fires we shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the well. The discussion you just heard was on how Bay Area South Asian communities are impacted by domestic violence issues during shelter in place. Zakia Afrin from Maya Tree and Bindu Omen Fernandez from Narika were in conversation with guest producer Priti Mangala Shaker. Please visit Maya Tree, which is spelled M A I T R I dot at M A I T R I dot org and narika, N-A-R-I-K-A dot org for more information about the work and in help to support them. So that's it for today's show. You can listen to our show again at our blog, kpfawomensmag.blogspot.com. You can find any segments you missed and links to all of our guests there as well. If you have a story you want us to cover or a women or gender-centered event you want us to announce, email womensmagazine at kpfa.org. Get updates by joining our Facebook group, which is Listen to KPFA Women's Magazine. Thanks to our webmistress, Blue Morove, and to engineer Lucretia Burton, who is at the controls. I'm Lisa Detmer, and as my co-producer, Kate Raphael, says, stay strong, stay in the streets, and stay tuned for About Health. Thanks for listening. We shall learn to lead in love. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these. Get it together. Hey everyone, this is Mitch Jesrich, urging you to become a KPFA ally, a sustaining partner, the lifeblood of our station. At $10 or more a month, your gift goes further by providing KPFA with a stable source of income to support the programming that you value. It's easy and it provides a tax deduction, plus it helps us reduce the amount of time needed on air for fund drives, and I like that a lot. So to become an ally, go to kpfa.org and click support. Thank you. Do you know what Area 941 is? It's kpfa.org's new podcasting space. This allows us to expand our programming with more on-demand programs so you can listen when you want or download them at any time. Area 941 is just another reason why people say, I heard it on KPFA. Greetings, I'm Idris Hassan, host and producer of Chocolate Beats Radio. I am also a graduate of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. 
The program is now accepting applications from Conscious Community members. You can download an application at kpfaapprentice.org or call 510-848-6767, extension 235. You're listening to KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley or KFCF at 88.1 FM in Fresno or K248BR at 97.5 in Santa Cruz or online at kpfa.org.